Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Choice of Magics, the Tank Media Games Reading Club, which is an informal name. It's not on any of our branding for this series, but nonetheless, I am reading. You're part of the club. Welcome. Don't forget to subscribe to Tank Media Games on Twitter for more news and updates to see what, what, what else we're putting out. We have plenty of stuff going on. Our Dungeons & Dragons show, um, our daily gameplay videos, game talks, all kind of stuff. So please be sure to subscribe and hang out with us on a daily basis. So, let's move on. We already read this one, so let's move. <clears throat> Excuse me. Methodically exploring the ruins, you head clockwise around the quadrangle to the next building, a tall, wide tower that looks as though it is some kind of crow's nest jutting above the cr crenellations on top. The tower is pocketed with holes already, especially at its base. Your spell seems to have infected all the wood of the academy. You think you might... I think you might have cut our time here short, Tao says. These buildings are holding this cavern ceiling up, but the holes are weakening them. Suddenly, the whole tower crushes its own first floor in a loud crash that sends up a huge dust cloud. But then, there are three new holes open up in the tower at its new base, one leading to some place dark and spider-webbed, another leading to a colorful room that looks like an arena for some kind of game, and a third that's protected by a curtain of light obscuring what's beyond. Could you, bar <coughs> could you burrow through the rock near the top of the tower somehow, Tao says? I think that's our best way out. Sure, you say. You could fly up with wings, but that would mean missing the opportunity to explore one more room. Tal doesn't know you can use Vivamancy to fly, so she won't be too upset if you take the long way up through the inside of the tower. You're not sure which is worse, risking the early collapse of the building or missing out on its treasures. The tower appears stable for now, but also a bit askew. Hmm. I don't know. The colorful arena seems like they want us to go in there and they're going to hurt us. Uh, explore the dark and webbed room. I explore past the curtain of light. When I read it, the, f the first one that jumped out to me was the colorful arena. Let's do the colorful arena. Let's see whether that room has a way up, you say, pointing to the colorful room. Sounds good, Tao says. The arena is a tall cylindrical room with a tiered seating all the way up the sides. There's enough space in the center for 30 people to stretch their hands across the diameter. <clears throat> you look up to where you're trying to go and see that the alcove that once served as the offensive team's goal is currently inhabited by 11 harpies. Both the males and females are bare-chested humans from the waist up, you try not to stare, but their wings and lower bodies are those of birds. A grayish blue plumage seems to run in the family, and the harpies are more attractive than you would imagine from stories, as if they were bred to be looked at. The harpies are currently gathered around a small fountain in their ancient nest, which seems to never run out of strange bright red liquid. It must be nutritious and endless to have kept this harpy family going for generations. The expressions on the harpies' faces are vacant, and as one drinks its fill, it lets out a bird-like cry in satisfaction. Apparently their human heads don't come with human brains. Between you and that nest are some of the hazards that would have faced an ancient harpy ball team. Assorted spherical metal traps floating on the defensive side, ready to sprout like spikes or fling nets on or what have you. The challenge of simply going up there, though that's harder for you than it would have been for an ancient harpy ball team, and the harpies themselves who may still reflexively guard their nest. Hmm, so they played a game with these creatures. In your immediate vicinity, you are also surrounded by twigs suggested, suggestive of a nest, but there are no harpies in this one. A red line painted on the wall ten feet up presumably marks the old starting line for the offensive team. There is also a metal platform painted white and black, perhaps for a referee, close to where you're standing. You experimentally jump on it, but nothing happens. You can think of a few plans that might work here, combining your magics. Fly up with Vivamancy wings, blast the harpies with negation magic, then carry Tao up. Glamour the harpies into carrying us, using Vivamancy to protect us from their poison nails. Use divination to learn how to repair the referee platform, then automation to fix it. Hmm. Let's see. What, what are we good at? Divination. Glamour we're really good at. Glamour and Vivamancy. Let's try, let's try to glamour these harpies. I don't know if they're if it's ineffective, but let's try it. Pew. Unsure how to render yourself immune to poison, you settle on creating thick scales for you and Tao that the harpy's nails will be unable to penetrate. When you explain the plan to Tao, she says, You're totally certain you can reverse this? You shrug. I'm not totally certain we won't die of heart attacks in the next five seconds, you say. Or, I'm not totally certain we won't die of heart attacks in the next five seconds, you say. Right, I forgot I shouldn't ask you about anything. Tao says, she sighs, go ahead. 
You put a hand on Tao's forehead and with your other hand draw light from the wood around you in which living moats swarm. Tao sniffs. Smells pretty good, she says. Kind of like pine and maple, maybe. Corium crassus capula carapaces, you say, and your skin as well as Tao's becomes covered with thick brown scales like a plain like a pant like a plain cracked with drought. 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 I'm not familiar with the usage of this word in this context, so I apologize for any mispronunciations. Reversible, Tao says, waving a finger at you and pulling a face made horrid by the scales. Well, mostly. We gained fighting, we lost charisma. Hmm. Next, you cast a glamour. You cross your arms over your chest, draw power from within you, and say, Felautia omnes clios veninum. A golden glow appears around you and dissipates. Hoping it work, you shout to the harpies, Hey, we're here for the tour. How about a lift? Your voice echoes through the arena and the harpies' attention is had, but they more or less go back to what they were doing, drinking from their fountain of red liquid. Apparently, we're not that interesting, you say. So now what, Tal says. Well, there's one thing they really want, which the glamour could, pe could play into, you say. The ball. Ah, Tal says. She shrugs and curls into a ball. You do the same. Hey, you shout again. And this, and this time, the Harpies see two undefended balls on the opposing team's side. You are soon hoisted up by the Harpies and carried up to their nest. Once the Harpies have dropped you off at their nest, they return to gathering around their fountain. You then negate the scaly enchantment. This experience has taught you that, the, that glamours can trick the viewer into thinking you are what the viewer most desires, but you, your form has to be somewhat plausible as well. We gained more glamour. In the nest, you find a crystal ball about a foot in diameter. The harpy is still impressed with you, allowing you to take the crystal ball for your own. The crystal ball should help you greatly with divination magic. We gain divination. Done with this place, you proceed out. You proceed out the back door of the loft with the harpy's nest. Your glamour wears off, leaving you with a lurching feeling in your stomach. A corridor of maintenance closets, which you rifle through for spare parts, gain automation. Leads to a stairwell and the intersection of four corridors. But down every corridor, you hear a crackling, popping sound of new holes opening up in the wood of the tower, caused by your vivimancy rongamuk. In fact, you think the tower is li listing slightly. Everything is at a slight angle. You realize now, fearing there is no time for other, further explanation, you take the stairs. You ascend to the aviary, aviary and air dock. need some water clear my throat you emerge onto the roof of the onto the roof of the large tower you had been exploring where you see a giant green dragon curled around an ancient airship about a hundred feet away the airship has no propellers or anything of the sort just a single tall mass for a crow's nest but you can tell from its heavy metal hull hemispherical on the bottom and aerodynamic on top that this was never a ship meant to sail through water the sleeping dragon curled about the mass is massive and ancient, the size of a nice two-story house, and its green scales look brittle and riddled with fungus and rot. Its breath smells slightly foul. You catch a whiff of rotten eggs that must be sulfur. The five other airships... <sighs> Excuse me, it's early. The five other airships of the air dock have all been smashed over the course of centuries, but the large central airship looks intact. You could attack this dragon while it's sleeping, though an attack would certainly wake it up. You could also try sneaking around it to explore. You give Tal an inquiring look about the dragon, and she gives you a dubious look in return that says, Are you crazy? As you eye the crow's nest, an interesting potential plan strikes you. Tal loves her purple stuffed monkey noodles, so much so that she keeps him tied around her waist wherever she goes, but she might be willing to let you animate him without, with automation. You think that as long as the dragon is sleeping, Noodles could try to sneak past the dragon and climb up to the crow's nest to have a better look around. The tower groans and lists to the side. You've made it a bit unhappy. I do not want to. I don't want to be a, a attacker, a, a dragon blaster. He doesn't. Maybe he's not so evil. Um. Goodness. I mean, I feel like they want me to do the noodles thing, which I th find interesting. So let's try that. Let's let's go where we think they want us to go for now. So we're going to animate noodles. With the sleeping dragon nearby, you try to keep your animation of noodles short and to the point, and most of all, quiet. Tal holds noodles forward somewhat timidly. Electron potent simia vita simulcra. 
you say, and lightning arcs down from the ceiling of the cavern to strike noodles. Tal can't help but yelp and drop the stuffed animal. We gained automation. You cast a nervous glance at the dragon, but it remains asleep. Noodles picks himself up and with a little wavy hand signals, look, I'm okay. Uh, how are you doing that? Tal asks incredul incredulously. We're both doing it, in a way, you say. Noodles just does whatever we imagine he'll do. I'm automating the process of imagination. Basically, making him move for real so your imagination doesn't need to do the work. Weird, Tal says. Just then, the tower shifts again to the right. It will probably collapse soon. Tal gives you a nervous look. You're pretty nervous about this yourself, but you can't quite bring yourself to leave the ruins until you really have to. You send Noodles past the dragon to g and get to the crow's nest. Noodles and get... Yeah, and get to the crow's nest. Noodle slinks skillfully past the dragon, then gracefully climbs the pole to the crow's nest, despite the fact that his paws are stumps and have no fingers. How's he doing that with no fingers, Tal asks, and Noodles grips and Noodles grip slips. Just be keep believing in him, you say, that's all that matters. Finally, Noodles reaches the top and triumphantly holds up a mottled a mottled dragon egg, almost as big as he is. Great job, Nudes, Tal shouts. <laughs> Excitedly Noodles leaps down onto the sleeping dragon, which lets out a little grunt. Oh, less than great job, Nudes, Tal says morosely. As Noodles hops down from the dragon and eagerly runs to you, proffering the egg, the dragon opens its eyes, rears up, and roars. The echoing roar has a bass you can feel in your chest. The tower can apparently feel those vibrations too as the whole structure slips two feet, settling with an impact that nearly sends you sprawling. The tower then begins to tilt more and more. It's probably time to get out of here. Uh oh. As you run back the way you came, the dragon leaps over you and lands with an echoing boom in front of the door, blocking your exit. Then it inhales and breathes flame. You duck behind the central airship. The dragon's breath sets the whole air dock ablaze. Though you avoided the brunt of the flames, you feel a pang of sorrow. You were hoping to be able to come back later for more knowledge, but with all the flammable wood and paper, everything will be incinerated by the time you can return. How will you get through the rock ceiling of the cavern above you? Mm -hmm. um, blast a rock ceiling with negation magic. Use automation magic to turn the central airship's mass into a drill. Use vivamancy to grow the wooden tower until it bursts through the ceiling. How are we on automation? We're pretty good. Negation, we're not into. I'm not a killer. Maybe I should develop my skills, though. So. Let's do automation. You raise one hand to the sky and point to the mass of the airship with the other. Netho! The airship's mass wrenches itself free from the ship and begins to spin madly about its egg's axis. You make a lifting motion with your hand and the mass lurches into the rock ceiling of the cavern, making a sound loud enough to, f to feel in your chest and spraying rock everywhere. We gained automation. The dragon itself seems too stunned to act. It lets out a defeated roar. When your drilling is done, daylight seems streams into the cavern bright compared to the artificial lights of the academy. Thunderheads still cover the whole sky, as always, and these dark clouds in particular seem unusually irritable. You suspect your own automation magic is to blame. You allow the mass to drop. Aviana aeroba volanta pluma. Your spell of vivamancy causes wings to grow from your back. You feel your mass overall get lighter in a way that may not reverse itself. We gain subtlety. We lost fighting. Hop on, you say to Tao. Tao hesitates, but Noodles prods her for a bit a little from his piggyback perch, and Tao reluctantly climbs on your back. This is crazy, Tao says. My best friend has wings, and now I'm just hopping on for a ride? No no biggie. Noodles must give her some kind of indignant look, because she adds, One of my best friends, alright. And with that, you fly out of the cavern and into the sky, clutching the dragon's egg to your chest. The ever-present thunderclouds above you look a bit peeved, like an ant colony that's been kicked. You look down and see this cavern collapsing. Apparently, the final hole you punched through it was enough to remove its keystone and bring the whole thing down. You won't re you won't be returning anytime soon. Oh, Tal says, rubbing your shoulder to cheer you up. Don't be sad. Look at it this way. You could have gone your whole life without ever seeing that library, but now you've seen it. And you can pursue your dreams. It may be the end of one thing, but it's the beginning of another. Isn't that exciting? Yeah, you say. It is. You've dreamed of being a wizard all your life. The ability to shape reality with mere thought and will seemed almost a fairy tale, but you finally have the tones necessary, tomes necessary to make it real. The Inquisitors will surely come for you again. People have vanished for knowing less than what you know. A conflict with the church seems inevitable. The end of one thing is the beginning of another, Tao repeats. That's how it always is, and I have a feeling this is the beginning of something big. Awesome. Chapter 2. 
so that was a pretty fun chapter one. I, I have to I have to say, out of the the couple of choice of games um, that I've read so far, this is pretty exciting, and, and the choices seem fun. I haven't there haven't been real big punishments for me yet though for choosing the wrong one. But I'm trying to do a good job, do my messing with my stats and, and considering those when I make decisions. Chapter two, home. The skies over the kingdom have not been clear since the time of the ancients. The eternal storm they created 2,000 years ago with their automation magics continues to make the world a gray, rainy place. At the moment, a light drizzle dampens your wings, but the storm isn't as bad as it could be. <sighs> Thunder crashes off to your right, somewhere along the coast of the Negative Sea. The Negative Sea is the huge bank of black and purple fog stretching along the eastern border of the kingdom of from, from north to south. Accidentally created at the end of the Great War 2,000 years ago, it blocks all passage to the lands of the East. The lands of the neighbors, the lands of the neighbors, once known as the Magisterian Empire, excuse me, it blocks passage to all land, to all to the lands to the East. The lands of the neighbors, once known as the Magisterian Empire. Whether the neighbors even still exist is a matter of speculation, but the mile-high negative C is certainly real. Composed of dense negative energy residue, it could dissolve anything that ventured inside. The plains to the west are scraggly and barren. It's early spring, and new growth is just starting to peek through the tan soil, but you can already see barren trails where death clouds have broken away from the negative sea and scour their way across the countryside. As the misty negative residue is relatively heavy, it travels low to the ground, which is just as well, as you're not sure what would happen if the eternal storm ever mixed with a death cloud. You land a mile outside of outside Akraton in a forest called the Mild Woods, so that you don't draw too much attention on your return. You painfully pull your wings back into your body. The spell on Noodles has worn off, and Tal has tied him around her waist again. Back to reality, I guess, Tal says, echoing your thoughts. She looks up at the thunderheads above. This doesn't look too bad, actually. We should be fine to get home. By the time you and Tal get back to town at sunset, the market in the town square is being dis disassembled for the day, with canopies rolled up and tent poles stacked. The scrawny sheep and heifers of the meat market are being herded down the street back to their pastures, complaining with bleats and moos. Some construction has halted for the day. The tall wood, wood and rope pulley system is covered with tarps in case it might r it rains tonight. Very good description. Good, good writing. I'm, I'm, I'm there. I'm in. I'm in this place. The market has emptied fast, leaving only St. Anne sitting cross-legged on a rug, dispensing advice to her last parishioner. The white-robed saint has, offer has offered healing and holy visions to Akraton for years, and her aura of holiness is palpable. This is where we part ways, Tal says. Thanks for the adventure. She lifts her pack, laden with whatever artifacts she could get her hands on. You can see old tomes and silver jewelry peeking through its opening. Mom was going to lose the house, but not anymore. I'm headed straight to the bank tomorrow, not even going to let her touch this stuff. Not keeping anything for yourself, you say? Tal shrugs. I don't know. Maybe if there's something left. Don't worry about it. Wait a moment, calls St. Anne. She's going to be. Wait a moment, calls St. Anne. We'll give her a voice. Tal, you need healing, St. Anne says, pointing to Tal's leg. Neither you nor Tal has been any trouble with the church before, so you're uncertain how to proceed. You think the saints act somewhat independently from the church. Could she have received a vision of your encounter with the Inquisitor? But St. Anne has, a aura, has an aura of holiness that makes it difficult to mistrust her. I'm sorry, Marie, St. Anne says to the plain-looking brunette who is her last client. It's no trouble, her parishioner, her parishioner insists. I think I was done. Then go with the Braxis. The plain-looking woman leaves. She looks familiar, but you can't place her. Uh, encourage Tal to get healing from St. Anne. Forget healing. Ask St. Anne how much she knows about our day. Sa ask St. Anne for a vision of my future, ignoring the suggestion of healing. We'll do the healing. Her leg is hurt. You may as well, you tell Tal. Okay, Tal says. Guess we, fi guess we found something your magic can't do. You'd like to correct her, but it would involve explaining why you didn't heal her earlier, so you don't. Tal goes to St. Anne, kneels and pushes her armor out of the way out of the way of her wound. St. Anne's hand glows, and you see tiny wriggling life in the beams of light that are drawn into it. It reminds you of Vivamancy, but this magic is more impressive in a way that you find hard to describe. Anne presses her hand to Tal's leg and murmurs a short prayer under her breath, and then it's over. It's not obvious how this healing was better than using Vivamancy, but you somehow trust that it is. Now, let me see if I have some advice for you as well. 
St. Anne says. She puts her thumb and forefinger to her temples and mutters another nearly inaudible prayer. Tal, the time is coming when it will be better to reveal everything. People fear what is unfamiliar more than the familiar. With friends in high places, anything is possible. Do you understand? You're somewhat taken aback. Surely Anne is suggesting Tal reveal that she is a shapeshifter. Okay, thanks, Tal says, frowning. She clearly doesn't quite believe it. being open is a good idea. St. Anne winces and put, puts a hand on her abdomen. I think that I think that must be my last miracle. Possibly my last anacreton, since I'm leaving tomorrow. Where are you going, you ask? Again worried this is connected to the Inquisitor. The capital, Anne says. I need some rest. She smiles sadly. I haven't ever had a holiday since coming here, did you know? Not once. Well, good luck, you say. Still uncertain as to what is happening with St. Anne. I'm afraid I'm out of luck, St. Anne says, but if I never see you again, I want you to remember this. I don't regret being a saint, not for one moment. Life always comes to an end. All we can do is live it beautif beautifully. You aren't sure what to say to this, and during your hesitation, St. Anne, Anne departs. Hmm. You then say goodnight to Tal as well. When you're out of sight, you cast divination to ask whether there's something you could do for St. Anne, but the divination comes up blank. If she is dying, there is no saving her. We increased our relationship with the church. Cool. We proceed to the home. Uh, you proceed to the home of banker Sarah, Sarah, whose basement you rent, and struggle with the storm doors as you try to conceal all the random artifacts you picked up from the academy. You have a feeling there was a clause prohibiting the storage of forbidden artifacts somewhere in that long contract you signed to rent the place. Working the doors open, you proceed into your basement abode. What does it look like overall? It's filled with memento. Rem rem Mementos reminding me of friends and family. The floor is dominated by a giant map of all the ruins I know about. I use a bunch of quirky ancient junk as furniture. <laughs> so far, we've been very concerned with ruins. Like We haven't talked a whole lot about how much we care about other people, but we're very concerned with finding things. So we're going to say there's a big map on the floor. The central room of your apartment looks more like an army's command headquarters in a place that is lived in. A giant map that you commissioned from a local artist is painted on the floor. You have added to the map some likely locations of sunken ruins of the ancients with X's through the, lo through the locations that didn't work out. A grid that uses a coordinate system you designed yourself is superimposed on the map and you keep a compass and straight edge nearby to keep your measurements precise. One wall is taken up with a bookshelf sorted by subject and then alphabetically by author. An armoire near the door contains your adventuring clothing sorted by appropriate climate, and next to that, cabinets containing your adventuring gear are sorted. Cabinets containing your adventuring gear are sorted by terrain, with the subterranean category moved to a basket on top for easy access. Overall, your apartment speaks to your determined, organized mind. Increase calculation, increase solemnity. One desk in the corner set, set a carefully calculated distance away from the map is reserved for the, your laboratory. Humble as, humble as it is or was before your expedition to the Sunken Academy, the random assortment of automatic trinkets whose power you were trying to unlock now seems like nothing compared to the hall you dump onto the desk. The dragon egg, which you swaddle in some sweaters, the conical wizard's hat, an ancient book about Abraxas from the old classroom, the crystal ball from the harpy's nest, which you place on a bowl from your tiny kitchen to keep it from rolling around, an assortment of spare automation parts you picked up while exploring the academy, and of course, the hefty tomes of magic you found, which will form the basis of your further magical study. You had quite a haul this time around. Happier than you have been in a long time, you go to your bedroom, a tiny room just big enough for your neatly made bed, and drift off to sleep. Alright folks, I think we're going to end that today. Uh, this will be the end of our of today's episode of um, Choice of Magics with me, your host, Keith, uh, of the Tank Media Games Reading Club. Thank you so much for watching. If you're enjoying this, if you're enjoying me reading this to you, please be sure to um, like this video, leave a comment, um, and just say, yeah, I'm enjoying it, keep going, or whatever. Uh, let me know. Uh, in the meantime, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for making it this far in the video, and I will see you in the next one. I love you very much. Bye-bye.